Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. The term learning theory sounds more intimidating than it actually is. Simply put, dogs learn through association. So, as dog owners, our goal is to teach our canine companions to associate words or cues with behaviors. Today, on DogWorks Radio, we're going to learn all about it. From First Paw Media, sponsored by Alaska Dog Works Professional Canine Training Center in Anchorage, Alaska. This is Dog Works Radio, committed to families and their dogs to build lifelong and fulfilling relationships. Visit our website at dogworksradio.com. Now, here are your hosts, Robert and Michelle Forto. Hello and welcome to Dog Works Radio. This is Michelle Forto and I am the lead trainer at Alaska Dog Works. And today we are going to dive deep into science, at least as it relates to dog training. Did you know that there are two main ways associations happen? Classical and operant conditioning. Classical conditioning occurs when a dog involuntarily associates two stimuli with each other. Consider this scenario. Dogs salivate when they smell food. So if we repeatedly ring a bell right before a dog smells food, it will soon associate the sound of a ringing bell with the food and begin to salivate involuntarily. The word classical refers to the fact that in this environment, learning is involuntary. The word conditioning refers to the process of which the teaching through association. Operant conditioning is just the opposite. When a dog learns to associate a voluntary behavior with a consequence, now the word consequence does not always refer to a negative repercussion. On the contrary, consequences are often desirable things in operant conditioning. In the earlier example, we learned that dogs can be conditioned to associate and anticipate food with the sound of a ringing bell, which causes them to salivate. Remember, dog training is as easy as A plus B equals C or antecedent plus behavior equals consequence. In operant conditioning, a dog is taught to offer a behavior such as a sit after being given a cue, but before it is given food. In this example, the dog learns that hearing or seeing the cue for sit antecedent slash stimulus plus the act of sitting voluntary behavior equals food consequence. Here we used a rewarding consequence to encourage the dog to continue sitting. This method is one of four ways that operant conditioning is used to teach a dog how to associate a behavior with an antecedent and consequence. These four methods or quadrants on a chart are referred to as positive and negative reinforcement and positive and negative punishment. In these examples, think of positive and negative as addition and subtraction rather than good or bad. Positive reinforcement is when we add something pleasant in order to reinforce or cause a behavior to continue Negative reinforcement is when we take away something unpleasant in order to cause a behavior to continue. Positive punishment is when we add something unpleasant in order to punish or cause a behavior to stop. 
Negative punishment is when we take away something pleasant in order to cause a behavior to stop. Can you identify which of these four methods I described in our example of operant conditioning? If you said positive reinforcement, you're right. We added something pleasant, the food. Once the dog sat in order to reinforce or cause the behavior to continue. This taught the dog to voluntarily sit in anticipation for a reward. So far in our examples, food has been the dog's motivation to salivate and sit. Motivators, or what trainers often refer to as drives, are used in conjunction with reinforcers, the things that make behaviors continue, and punishers, the things that make behaviors stop, in order to teach dogs how to associate behaviors with antecedents and consequences. Drives come in many different forms and vary widely from dog to dog. And it is important to remember that different dog breeds were traditionally bred to complete different tasks, which require different personality traits that can affect their motivation to do or not to do something. For example, while one dog may be perfectly content with petting and praise as a reward, sociability, or what we call pack drive, Others prefer to avoid human touch altogether. Some dogs enjoy chasing other animals or objects, using their prey drive, and others love to play with other dogs, people, or toys using play drive. Food isn't the only viable reward in training. Many dogs are content with the opportunity to play. At this point, Let's return to those four quadrants of operant conditioning for a moment. We have already learned about positive reinforcement when we added food as a reward to encourage a dog to continue sitting when it was given a cue. Positive reinforcement is the preferred training method for most professional dog trainers. It has been scientifically proven to increase the rate of learning, encourages dogs to work harder for rewards, eliminates the need for the use of force or aversive training tools, and fosters a human-canine bond built upon mutual trust and respect, rather than one on a dog's desire to avoid fear, pain, or punishment. So how do the other three quadrants of operant conditioning work and are any of them appropriate in training? Let's consider another example. Imagine you have a lab who is highly motivated by human attention. That's the sociability pack drive. And as a result, it jumps on strangers when they enter the house. You consider this to be an inappropriate way to greet guests. So you start yelling, no, 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 off. This is an example of positive punishment. You are adding something unpleasant, the yelling, in order to punish or stop a behavior, the jumping. What most owners do not realize is that yelling off or no is actually the least effective way to solve this problem. Think about what the dog is trying to accomplish in this situation. Jumping is an attention-seeking behavior, and by reprimanding your dog, by yelling, it is still rewarding him with what he craves, attention, even if it is unpleasant. This is what I would call a negative attention getter. And because the dog has not been taught what to do instead of jump on guests, not only will the behavior continue, but you are also inadvertently affecting the way he perceives you. Dogs can begin to see humans who use positive punishment as the thing that causes unpleasant things to happen, which leads many dogs to stop listening to their owners altogether. When this occurs, many owners often confuse their dog's desire to avoid something unpleasant, in this case the yelling, with general stubbornness and, in extreme cases, or through the use of aversive and inhumane training tools, dogs can even learn to become aggressive in order to deter something unpleasant from happening. So, 
How do we safely teach dogs that jumping is wrong without inadvertently causing all of these repercussions? It's actually pretty simple. Just turn your back to the dog or remove yourself from the area altogether. Or take a moment and teach the dog to sit properly prior to your guest coming into the home and then teach the dog a visit command where he must keep all four feet on the floor before he gets the reward, which is being pet by your guests. So if you turn your back or remove yourself from the area altogether, that is a form of negative punishment as you are causing the behavior to stop. By removing the negative, the dog's opportunity for reward, which is the attention. But remember, this is only half of the equation. Whenever we punish a behavior, it is always best to show dogs what we want them to do instead. So as soon as they put all four on the floor, we should reward them with a treat. Or actually, from my professional recommendation I put them on a sit and then I teach them to visit and I don't give them the treat the treat is actually them getting the reward of being visited and petted by your guests that have come into your home but let's go ahead and look at that last quadrant of operant conditioning negative reinforcement is the act of removing something unpleasant in order to reinforce or cause a behavior to continue Consider this example. John has a German shepherd that pulls on its leash, so John decides to use a prong collar to teach the shepherd not to pull. Prong collars work by pinching the skin of a dog's neck when there is tension on the leash, teaching dogs to avoid the pain associated with pulling on the leash. The act of adding something unpleasant, the pinching, to cause a behavior to stop is positive punishment. But the act of removing something unpleasant, the pinching, when there is no tension on the leash, is actually a form of negative reinforcement. In this example, positive punishment and negative reinforcement work in tandem with one another. And in all cases with these two training methods, it is important to remember that in order to negatively reinforce or positively punish a wanted or unwanted behavior, some form of pain or discomfort be it physical or emotional, has to be present in the training, even if only at a low magnitude. And as we learned earlier, this is not always in the best interest of our dogs for the human-canine relationship. Here at Alaska Dog Works, we adhere to the least intrusive, minimally aversive method of training in order to achieve the desired result. Guided by the findings of scientific research, we focus our training programs on positive reinforcement methods first and foremost, but we also recognize and believe that there are some training applications where it is not only appropriate, but important to inform dogs when they are doing something wrong by humanely removing the opportunity for reward or negative punishment. Dog training is not complicated but it can be complex and it is entirely situational to ensure that you and your dog are set up for success. Get in touch today to schedule a free discovery session with an experienced trainer today. I'm going to take a short break here. And when we come back, we are going to go behind the breed and learn a little bit about the German short haired pointer. So earlier you learned about first paw coffee company. And now I'm going to tell you about its Tail Wagger Blend. First Paw Coffee Company's Tail Wagger Blend is their first offering, and its name and label were crowdsourced from their Facebook fans. How cool is that? The Tail Wagger Blend is a private label premium blend that was developed just for them. It is a medium roast from Colombian beans with tastes of Brazil nuts, grapefruit, and oak. Be sure to go to ak.dog slash free and enter to win a bunch of cool prizes. That's ak.dog slash free. We're living in uncertain times. If there is one thing we can be thankful for, that is the recent pet adoption boom. Shelters are being cleared out, and that means you may not know much about your new best friend. Alaska Dog Works virtual and on-site classes are the best way for you to build a lasting bond and learn about your pup, new or old. From setting up a proper routine to learning the commands and much more, Alaska Dog Works provides you with the resources to develop your dog into one of the best. Right now, Alaska Dog Works has an exclusive offer just for our listeners. 
Go to alaskadogworks.com now and use promo code DOGWORKS and save 20% off your training program at the time of your booking. Visit alaskadogworks.com and use promo code DOGWORKS to save 20% today. That's alaskadogworks.com and use promo code DOGWORKS at the time of booking. All right, you guys, we are back. Before the break, we learned all about learning theory and how it can be applied to dog training. Now I'm going to talk to you about the German short-haired pointer. Male German short-haired pointers stand between 23 and 25 inches at the shoulder and weigh anywhere from 55 to 70 pounds. Females run smaller. The coat is solid liver, a reddish-brown color, or liver and white in distinctive patterns. The dark eyes shine with enthusiasm and friendliness. Built to work long days in the field or at the lake, GSPs are known for power, speed, agility, and endurance. Noble and aristocratic are words often used to describe the overall look. GSPs make happy, trainable pets who bond firmly to their family. They are always up for physical activities like running, swimming, organized dog sports. In fact, anything that will burn some of their boundless energy while spending outdoors time with a human buddy. A few quick stats. Temperament. Friendly, smart, and willing to please. AKC breed popularity ranks them 9 out of 195 height 23 to 25 inches for males 21 to 23 inches for females males weighing in between 55 and 70 pounds with females weighing between 45 and 60 life expectancy of gsps is 10 to 12 years and they are categorized in the sporting group for the akc here's a little bit of history about german short-haired pointers German hunters spent generations crossing various breeds until they perfected this versatile bird dog sometime in the 1800s. They were so successful that to this day, GSPs are among the top winning breeds in competitive hunting events. The German bird dog tradition dates to at least the 1700s with master breeders experimenting with tracking hound pointing dog crosses in the quest for a quick, a powerful hunter possessing plenty of nose and versatility. It comes as no surprise to learn that a key player in the early development of this breed of noble bearing was himself a nobleman, Prince Albrecht Süßlohm's Braunfels. The prince and his fellow enthusiasts succeeded beyond their wildest imaginings in creating a do-it-all hunting dog. Here, a breed historian ticks off the GSP's credentials. A staunchly pointing bird dog. A keen-nosed night trailer. A proven duck dog. A natural retriever on land or water. With pleasing confirmation and markings and great powers of endurance. And an intelligent family watchdog and companion. The GSP has been... Hunted with success on a variety of quarry, game birds, possum, rabbit, raccoon, and even deer. With his webbed feet and sleek but sturdy construction, the GSP burnishes his resume as one of the dogdom's finest swimmers. Emblematic of the breed's eager versatility was Marvin, a GSP from North Carolina who in late 2013 achieved his 75th AKC title. Let's learn about care and training, shall we? For the GSP, you want to feed a high-quality dog food that is appropriate to the dog's age, puppy, adult, or senior, and activity level. A pup under six months old will need to be fed more than twice a day. Once the GSP reaches adulthood, a meal in the morning and evening should be sufficient. Because the breed is subject to bloat, they should not be fed immediately after running or vigorous exercise, nor should they be allowed to run or exercise for at least an hour after eating and drinking. The ideal evening meal time would be after physical activities are through for the day. 
The GSP does best with plenty of exercise and things to do, such as running, swimming, and dog sports. In fact, anything that will burn some of their boundless energy while spending time outdoors with a human buddy. Their routine should be ideally including ample physical activity twice a day. This might be in the form of brisk half-hour walks in the morning and evening or running and playing in a securely fenced area. GSPs are smart and athletic and excel in a wide range of canine activities that exercise mind and body, from field events to agility, obedience, and even dock diving. Early training is essential for the German short-haired pointer. Socialization and puppy training classes are vital, continuing with practice in basic obedience commands. This is an intelligent breed that learns quickly with consistent training sessions. GSPs need a purpose, and without one, they can be destructive if left to their own devices. The breed can be extremely challenging from six months to three years old. GSPs have a very high energy level and a strong prey drive. And they need an owner with an active lifestyle to guide the dog's exuberance and intensity into positive outlets. If you'd like to learn more about how to train your German short-haired pointer to be one of the best trained dogs, give us a call today at Alaska Dog Works. And as always, please follow us on our social channels. Just search DogWorks Radio and check out alaskadogworks.com for more training tips and tricks. I'll see you next time. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. Learn more at firstpaw.coffee. From First Paw Media, this is Dog Works Radio. We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe too. Your hosts are Robert and Michelle Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto and created for First Paw Media. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forto and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.